In today's program, we're going to examine the fine art of overthrowing foreign governments by taking a detailed look at three CIA-engineered coup d'etat, Iran in 1953, Guatemala in 1954, and Chile in 1973. To help us understand this important subject, we're very fortunate to have with us Stephen Kinzer, author of Overthrow, A History of U.S. Engineered Coup d'etat. Mr. Kinzer, a former New York Times bureau chief, is now a visiting professor at Northwestern University, where he teaches courses on foreign affairs. Mr. Kinzer, thanks very much for being with us today. Pleasure. Could you lay out for us your criteria for picking these particular 14 overthrows? Uh, Actually, when I started out writing this book, my idea was to write about all the times the U.S. had overthrown a foreign government. So my first step was to look around for the list. But I soon discovered that there is no such list. Nobody's ever actually compiled a list of what countries we've overthrown. And as I began to research this, I realized the reason for that. The reason is that it's not always clear cut. When did the U.S. actually overthrow a government? When did we just intervene heavily to help someone else overthrow a government? When did we protect a regime that was friendly to us against being overthrown? Would that count? So uh, there's a big gray area here. I decided I had to make up my own list and set up my own criteria. So my criteria was only to write about cases in which the United States was the decisive factor in the overthrow of a foreign government. I wasn't going to include any cases where the U.S. helped out or was part of a coalition, or even places where the U.S. intervened over many years but never actually overthrew a government. It was with those criteria that I came up with the list of the 14 countries that I cover in my book. Well, I'd like to get into the details of a few of those coups as illustrative, but before we do, I'd like to look at some of the broader points you make in your book. For example, what does the rise of multinational corporations have to do with regime change? It has everything to do with regime change and with America's position in the world. At the end of the 19th century, there was a great change going on inside the United States. First of all, the frontier was officially declared closed in 1890. There was no more room to expand to undiscovered areas within North America. Secondly, American manufacturing businesses and American farm businesses were really mastering the economies of scale. They were producing huge amounts of material, consuming ever larger amounts of resources. They couldn't get all that they needed in the United States, either resources or markets. So all of this led them to start looking abroad. It was the rise of these companies that had international interests that brought the U.S. government into the business of defending American commercial interests abroad. Sometimes you hear this phrase, business follows the flag. Actually, it's the other way around. Well, now, could we take a look at the Iran operation in 1953? It was called Operation Ajax. Could you tell us who the leader of Iran Mossadegh was and, and why Britain and then later the United States wanted to overthrow him? It's a fascinating story because it shows how differently the world looked from cosmopolitan Western capitals and from poor capitals like Tehran. What happened in Iran was uh, very similar to what happened in many other countries after World War II. Uh, Partly because of the rhetoric of Franklin Roosevelt, the winds of nationalism and self-determination and national development and patriotism were blowing through Asia and Africa and Latin America. In all these countries, there was a great desire for people to take control of their own destiny. In Iran, that sentiment focused on one particular injustice. All of the oil in Iran, thanks to a corrupt deal that had been reached with a former monarch, was 100% owned by one company, and that company was British and owned mainly by the British government. What it meant was that Britain, through the ownership of this one company, controlled all the discovery, all the refining, all the production, and all the sales of all the oil in Iran. 
this is what powered British industry and allowed the British people to live at a high standard of living all during the 1920s and 30s and 40s. It's what powered the Royal Navy as it projected power all over the world. England doesn't have any oil. No other British colony had oil. All the oil that England used during this period came from Iran. In the meantime, Iranians were living in one of the lowest, most miserable standards of living anywhere in the world. So in the period after World War II, there was a great popular sentiment in Iran, let's nationalize our oil industry. Let's take it back from this British company. And the parliament passed a law to that effect, unanimously, and the elected leader who was charged to carry out this law was Mohammad Mossadegh. So Mossadegh became the prime minister of Iran who was leading the nationalistic campaign to take back control of the Iranian oil industry. That got the British hugely upset through a long series of machinations. They brought the Americans into the project. And in the summer of 1953, the CIA sent an agent into Iran who, in the space of just a few weeks, threw the country into chaos and secured the overthrow of the democratically elected leader, Mohammad Mossadegh. So up until 1953, Iran had been a functioning democracy. Had we been able to tolerate it and work with it instead of overthrow it, we might have had a thriving democracy in the heart of the Muslim Middle East. Some of the tactics were, were very interesting and I think have been repeated. The picking a retired general as a coup leader, someone we groomed to be the leader, was reminiscent of Chalabi in, in Iraq, the bribery of various people. Could you talk about how we engineered it? There are certainly a number of patterns that run through these operations and they were quite visible in Iran. One that I think is very interesting has to do with motive. We talked earlier about how the original motivation of the, many of these operations is economic, but the motivation morphs a couple of times. When the companies that are aggrieved present their grievances to the U.S. government, the government then convinces itself that it's not acting for economic reasons, but because any government that would try to bother an American company must be anti-American, must be the tool of one of our foreign enemies, that therefore we are justified in attacking it. And then, of course, the motivation morphs another time when it has to be presented to the public. That's when it becomes this, uh, we only did it to save them. The, the American press then, including your old employer, the New York Times, ended up playing an important role in characterizing Mossadegh. It's true. Mossadegh was portrayed in the West largely as kind of an unbalanced, bizarre uh, old man. And it only seemed the logical conclusion that if the leader of some faraway, very poor and weak country wanted to stand up to the giant powers of the world, political and economic, and reject the system by which the world was being ruled, almost automatically you think the guy has to be some kind of an imbalanced, crazed person. And that was sort of the way he was portrayed in the U.S. It went even further when the next year we overthrew President Darbenz in Guatemala. Uh, his name was blackened in the U.S. as a communist and an enemy of the United States, not just uh, because of his actions, but because the United Fruit Company, the biggest American corporation in Guatemala, hired a very sophisticated public relations concern whose job was systematically to feed detrimental information and biased information about Guatemala to American reporters. So the manipulation of the American press and public opinion, which definitely played a role in the run-up to our invasion of Iraq, is nothing new. This is something that leaders in the U.S. as well as in many other countries have learned how to do. Now the operation in, in Iran in 53 wasn't very subtle. Wasn't Kermit Roosevelt operating with within Iran and hiring gangs of people to help them? Probably what Kermit Roosevelt did would not have been possible if Iran had been the dictatorship that the U.S. said it was. The fact that Kermit Roosevelt and his agents were able to go around and bribe newspaper editors and politicians and religious leaders and military officers 
is a reflection of the fact that there was no heavy secret police presence in that country. It's there very was ironic. An open society, and actually in Iran, we wound up doing what we did in Guatemala. Also, the next year, we overthrew an elected leader who essentially embraced American principles and replaced him with a tyrant who detested everything the United States stands for. Now, now, Kermit actually hired people to argue both sides of the issue in the streets, right, in order to create the illusion that there was a whole lot of unrest going on. This was a wonderful part of Kermit Roosevelt's plan. Not only did he buy out newspapers to have print articles about how evil Mossadegh was and have religious leaders denouncing Mossadegh as an atheist and create this whole public opinion campaign, But he also hired a mob of thugs to run through the streets of Tehran and beat up pedestrians, fire shots into stores, and break windows and shout, we love Mossadegh, we love communism. And it wasn't enough to do that. Kermit Roosevelt had an even better idea that he would hire a second mob to attack this first mob. The idea was that this would create the impression that Tehran had fallen into complete chaos and that the government was no longer able to control the situation. I don't think that the people fighting on either side of those gang wars really understood that they were all working for the CIA. So the Shah then was also brought in by the CIA. The Shah was a very scared young man at this time. It was very hard for him to persuade himself to join into this plot because he was afraid it might be dangerous for him and anything that was dangerous was well beyond what he was willing to tolerate. The Americans finally forced him into accepting the plot only on condition that he would be right next to a little private airfield and could fly out of the country if it seemed to go wrong. Sure enough, it did seem to go wrong on its first attempt. And what did the Shah do? He ran out to a little private plane at this airport and fled the country. So he wound up sitting in Rome and was having dinner in a restaurant there when some correspondents excitedly brought him in the news that there had been another attempt in Iran, and it had succeeded, and he was now being brought back into power. This guy was sitting in exile in an Italian restaurant when he was told, by the way, you can be the king again now. So it was the Americans who placed him back on the throne, and what was the long-term effect of that? He ruled for 25 years with increased repression, That repression ultimately produced the explosion of the Islamic Revolution in the late 1970s. That revolution brought to power a clique of fanatically anti-American clerics who have spent the last 25 years eagerly and sometimes very violently trying to undermine American interests all over the world. We're now heading for a huge crisis with Iran on this nuclear issue, but this nuclear issue would never have emerged. And this Islamic government in Iran would never have emerged if the United States had kept its fingers off and been patient enough not to intervene and topple the Iranian democracy in 1953. You mentioned another democratically elected leader that we overthrew. That was our Benz in 1954. What had he done to earn our ire? Actually, they were very similar cases, Iran and uh, Guatemala. In Guatemala, there was one huge foreign company that dominated the whole economy and controlled the only resource of the country. The same thing had been true in Iran. In Guatemala, the resource was bananas, and the company was the United Fruit Company. This was a uniquely powerful company in the U.S., very well connected in the Eisenhower administration. Now... Guatemala had been under classic Latin American tyranny for many years. In 1944, there was a civil uprising and democracy began in Guatemala. The same trends of nationalism were felt there, they were felt in Iran. In Guatemala, though, that nationalism was focused towards taking over the oil company. In Guatemala, it was focused toward getting something better out of the fruit company. Uh, The Guatemalan Congress passed a land reform law requiring that any entity in Guatemala that had more than 100,000 acres of unused land 
had to sell it to the government to be distributed to peasants. Well, the only company that fit into that category was United Fruit, which had half a million acres of land that it was just keeping for a possible future need. The Guatemalan government passed a law requiring that it sell that land to the government for use by peasants. The United Fruit Company was very upset. It went back to Washington to complain. Soon, a whole public relations campaign was launched in the United States, portraying Arbenz as a communist and the Guatemalan government as a tool of the Kremlin. On the back of this campaign, the United States organized a modest little exile invasion and a bombing campaign by CIA planes. That, that invasion that you recount in such detail in your book, it's almost humorous if it weren't really the overthrow of a government. It has to do with the kind of a phony invasion and false radio reports. Could you describe that in some detail? It really was a case in which the CIA decided that it would try to use some Guatemalan exiles as a cover for an American CIA operation. So they recruited small gang of Guatemalan exiles and sent them across the border from Honduras. And then as soon as they crossed in Honduras, they just stopped and sat there just a couple of miles inside the border. That was the invasion. But meanwhile, there was a CIA radio station that was purportedly broadcasting from within the country, the great progress of the invasion? Exactly. The CIA had set up a radio station, and they had all this stuff taped in advance in Miami, that was portraying this handful of ragged exiles in a few cars as an advancing army that was being uh, swollen by crowds of fervent Guatemalan patriots and deserting military units as it swept across the Guatemalan highlands toward the capital. In order to underline these false reports, the CIA sent planes over Guatemala City and over several other areas to bomb them, to make it seem as if there was some kind of a coordinated attack going on. So all of this was kind of a reflection of how governments in poor countries were not yet equipped to deal with the kinds of subversive tools that the CIA had come up with. Later on, these governments became more clever and it became more difficult for covert operations to work. That's why someone like Saddam Hussein was never vulnerable to covert action. But back in those days, it was very easy for a rich and powerful country like the United States to throw a weak and poor country like Iran or Guatemala into chaos. So what happened to Arbenz, and what was the fallout for the country? Arbenz was finally forced to resign in 1954. The government imposed by the United States proved to be extremely repressive. It provoked an uprising that led to a 30-year civil war that was the most savage episode in the modern history of Latin America killing far more people than Chile and Argentina and Brazil conflicts put together. Guatemala was not only bathed in blood for the next 30 years, but it also served as a political example to a whole generation of rising leaders in Latin America. Let me give you just one example. During the period when Arbenz was in office and Guatemala was a democracy, a number of people from Latin American countries came to Guatemala just to watch and see what was happening there, since democracy was something new in Latin America. One of these was a young Argentine doctor named Che Guevara. Che Guevara was actually in Guatemala at the time the U.S. overthrew the government, and he had watched the whole process that led up to that overthrow. He actually had to go into uh, asylum on the night of the coup in the Mexican embassy. After a few days, he was allowed to leave the country. He went to Mexico, and there he met Fidel Castro, who was planning his revolution back in Cuba. Now, Castro was very interested in Guatemala. He wanted to hear from Che everything that had gone on there. So Che went on and explained the whole story of how the U.S. had corrupted the Congress and manipulated the press and had its friends in the military uh, working for the subversive cause. They had long discussions about this. And Castro and Che Guevara reached a conclusion based on the events of Guatemala. Their conclusion was, if we get into power, it's not going to be possible for us to push a reform program 
within the framework of democracy. The U.S. won't allow that. They'll come in because we'll be bothering American companies, and they'll use our democratic institutions like political parties and the press to subvert the country and overthrow us. So when we get to power, the first thing we do is close all newspapers, ban political parties, outlaw demonstrations and dissent, and we'll wipe away the entire army, replace it with our own army. So this is the lesson that the United States, through its intervention in Guatemala, taught to a whole generation of rising leaders in Latin America. You cannot have real reform in democracy. If you want to try something radical to change the qualities of life in Latin America, you have to do it under a dictatorship. And that led to untold pain for Latin America. And now, Stephen, as you say, overthrowing a poor agrarian a country is not as hard as overthrowing an industrial country, and that brings us to Chile, which is more developed, and I was particularly fascinated by your account of how we economically sabotaged Chile. C- could you talk about how that coup was born and then the economic strangulation which put pressure on the country? The Chile case was a very interesting one, in part because it came out of the same impulses that led us to the coups in Guatemala and Iran. In Chile, just as in those two countries, there was one giant national resource. In Chile's case, it was copper. And just as in Iran and Guatemala, rising nationalist sentiment led people in the country to want to control that resource. Salvador Allende was the elected president who implemented that nationalization decree. And that set off huge alarm bells in Washington. So what the United States set out to do was to strangle Chile economically. This was part of the program that once Chile had been brought to its knees economically, it would be much easier to overthrow the regime militarily. What we did is we started voting against loans for Chile and international institutions. We would downgrade the quality, uh, reliability ratings of Chile and financial instruments in the U.S. so that American banks would not loan there. The businesses coordinated a plan where they wouldn't send any replacement parts for any mechanical goods in Chile over a period of years. Some of them were ITT. ITT was one of the main companies involved in this project. Kennecott Copper. Kennecott Copper and Anaconda were the two others. Pepsi-Cola played a very important role. In in fact, wasn't there a personal contact between President Nixon and someone at Pepsi-Cola that played into this? During the period when Richard Nixon was out of office, between the time he left the uh, vice presidency in the early 60s and the time he came back as president, he worked as an international lawyer, and one of his principal clients was Pepsi-Cola. Nixon played a very important legal role for Pepsi-Cola during the mid-60s, and became very well connected with the Pepsi-Cola corporate leadership. The very first person to come to Washington and alert Nixon to the changes in Chile, the impending election of Allende and all the trouble it might mean for the United States, was the Chilean director of Pepsi-Cola. That was a person that had direct access to Nixon and to highest echelons in his administration. So. Certainly, the role of businesses in coordination with the U.S. government in creating an economic climate that led Chile toward instability was very, very important in setting the country on the way to its disaster of 1973. In addition to that, there was a necessity for an assassination of an important general, right? Yes, it's true. There was a important Chilean general who was a, a strong believer in constitutional rule. Chile had been one of the greatest democratic success stories in Latin American history. This was partly due to the fact that the military was strictly apolitical, since the military and many other Latin American countries had been the source of instability. But this general was unwilling to break with the Chilean uh, political tradition of uh, military uh, non-interference. The United States realized that this guy uh, had to be assassinated if the coup was going to succeed. We actually sent in a diplomatic pouch a pistol and ammunition to conspirators inside the Chilean army. And the day after we did that, the general we didn't like was indeed assassinated. That opened up the way to the coup. What was the final scene for the coup for Allende? 
President Allende was at home in bed or very early in the morning at dawn when the first news came that something unusual was happening. He had a little bunker there, might have wanted to make a stand, but the uh, presidential palace, which was on, in another part of town, had traditionally been the symbol of Chilean democracy. So Allende decided he wanted to make his last stand there. He jumped into a car with some bodyguards and friends, about two dozen altogether. They ran into the palace. Soon after that, bombing began. The palace was being bombed by uh, Chilean military pilots. There was apparently some demand to Allende to surrender. It's still unclear. But in the end, military uh, commandos charged into his office. As far as we know, he killed himself. And what was the fallout for Chile? Chile went through a terrible period of repression. There were tens of thousands of murders. There were hundreds of thousands of tortures. Chile went from being the example of democratic Latin America to the example of the extremes of repression in Latin America. It has now slowly begun to climb out of its pit, but uh, it's a country that's very deeply scarred. Thank you very much, Mr. Kenzer. It was a pleasure. Thank you.